This is Jim McConnell. Welcome to a live chemist corner for our distributor in the UK, Jericho and Ligla. And we've been asked to talk about mixing brands. You know, what do we do when we mix brands and is it advisable? So we're gonna go over a couple of things, but the big story on this one in a, just a quick nutshell is we don't advise mixing brands. And there's a lot of reasons why, because not all brands are the same. The raw materials that are used in a lot of the different brands can be the same, but that's just at the raw material level. But the quantity of those raw materials can vary significantly. And some of the chemistry that's involved that goes into the curing process can vary significantly. And so when we look at some of these brands that are on the market, some of them contain raw materials that help it cure tech free. And if the photo initiator content is extremely high, in some brands that require a very powerful UV light or LED light. And then you have other brands that have those resins in them that require less energy for the curing process because the resins react much, much faster because it involves different chemistry. Those products when used in a light that is designed to cure brands with high photo initiator contents, then you can get extreme exothermic reactions. They can be extremely uncomfortable. That's two extremes in one sense because it's important. So mixing brands, we really don't advise it. Some brands are similar, some brands are not, and it's difficult for you to determine what those are. The best way for me to address this is if we go over to our screen here to the right, what we have is we have a way to measure the amount of energy that's given off from the carried light. And if we start from the curing light standpoint, not all curing lights are the same. If we take a look at ultraviolet light versus visible light and all the way up into infrared, in the ultraviolet, it's a short wavelength. In infrared, it's a long wavelength. And in between, we have various wavelengths that determines what the color is. But when we're looking at the ultraviolet and into the violet spectrum, those are the wavelengths that the lights that we use emit various energy sources, then those energies will affect how well something cures. So what is an uh, energy spectral analysis? It's a way to evaluate exactly what the energy output is from a curing light. And we have a special equipment in the back and the QC in one of them in our R&D lab that measures the spectral output of various curing lamps. How does it matter to the world? Why does it matter to the industry? because every light has a different output. And we can average that output over the wavelengths that photo initiators are actually functional. And if we take a look at analyzing those wavelengths for that functionality that is applicable to our industry, um, we can measure how effective that is going to be for a curing lamp and how it's gonna cure a gel. So when we take a look at that, are all lamps similar? No. And you might want to know how we can evaluate that and how we can prove it. So when we take a look at the output from a light, we have our LED dot Gen 3, and it emits at 395 nanometers. It's kind of tough to see probably through the picture, but it's a very narrow peak, okay? Our LED dot Gen 2 has two peaks, one's at 365 and one's at 395. So the 365 peak will give us our emittance value in the UV range. 395 is a wavelength that our eyes can see. And it is what we could call near UV. So it's on the shorter end of the violet spectrum, but we can still see it so it's not quite ultraviolet. Our eyes cannot see ultraviolet light, or if we do, it's really, really, really dim. If you take a look at the output from the 365 peak, it would just kind of taper off and come down towards the baseline here, and our eyes can see what tapers off, but it can't see at the 365. If we average them out, then it gives us our average output. So here for our Gen 2, its average is about 33, 34 on this scale here, which is our irradiance value. So it is in watts per square meter, or milliwatts per square centimeter. And here with our Gen 3, it's clustered about 38. So the Gen 3 is a little bit more powerful than the Gen 2. 
Uh, at least in these measurements, every light can be a little bit different. And what we get is we have just these different spectral outputs. So when we take those measurements, we take various readings throughout the interior of the light based on where your fingers should go. And we number those one through seven, and then we average across all one through seven, and that's what kind of gives us the next series of measurements. And you can see here that we have various lights on the market. And we have C and D, a Sun One, Sun Bell, LED Dot Mini, the gel bottle, one that I got from Amazon called J.E. Whitney, um, our Gen 3, some other sun lights. And then we average those out, out here in number eight. So under number eight, the most powerful light that we have is the C and D light. So that's impressive. And it gives us a really good number on this scale. Uh, the next one over would be our LED dot mini, and then our Gen 3 and our Gen 2. And everything else seems to taper back down again. If you're getting a light and you're buying it from Amazon, or if you're buying it from, let's say, uh, oh, where does that link? Uh, Ali, AliExpress. A lot of those lights fall in this lower range down here. And that won't work to cure a lot of jobs that use chemistry that does not involve high concentrations of photo initiators. And they can still generate quite a bit of heat. But if you try and cure, say, a light a gel that's been designed to cure in the CMD layer, or what has been designed to cure in one of our labs, and you try and cure it in that less expensive light that's designed for different type of energy curing, you're going to get a good cure. If you don't get a good cure, you have more breaking, you have more lifting, you'll have a lot more uh, allergy potential. And so if you mix brands and you are using different brands that will give us different curing information with chemistry that requires a higher cure rate, then what you're gonna wind up with is allergies or you're gonna wind up with a lot of cracking and lifting. So when you say about mixing brands, making sure that you don't mix the different gels or if you do, you have to use the proper curing light for that gel. And don't try and cure a gel that requires, say, the C and D lamp or the light elegance lamp and try and cure it in a sun forming because it's not going to cure the sun. Here at McConnell Labs, we don't only just make light elegance, but we make other brands. And some of those other brands, the first thing that I ask for them to do is send me their curing light. And we formulate the exact specific formulation to cure in that specific light because not all lights are the same and not all brands are the same Does that makes sense so when we take a look at these things we have to make sure that it cures properly in that light and the other thing that we'll do is we'll do a differential analysis to find out how much exoteric reaction is being generated by the curing process so exothermic reactions are reactions that give off heat and that heat that's generated, we can measure that very accurately with the proper temperature probes. Here's one type of temperature probe. It's very, very small. And here's another one. Again, very, very small. And the smaller the probe, the faster it's going to respond to increases or decreases in the heat during the curing process. And then we'll measure that amount of spectral, well, of not spectral, thermal uh, activity with a computer. And when we measure it, we'll go ahead and the temperature of the reaction is equal to the temperature of the sample during the curing process minus the temperature inside the curing light. Because if you put your hand inside a light that's on, it's warm. So we want to subtract that amount of heat from the reaction at the same time. And when we do that, we get the temperature actually of the reaction itself. How does it connect to energy spectral analysis? Um, we use the spectral ana analysis work to determine how strong that light is. And the stronger the light, the faster it's gonna react, the more heat's can be generated. And then over a period of time, if we cure it once, and then we cure it a second time, how much heat is generated from that light during that second curing process? What we wanna do is make sure that the amount of, of heat being generated on the second cure, the third cure, the fourth cure, the fifth cure is almost non-existent or dramatically reduced. The smaller that reduction, uh, and what that is going to determine is how well it cured the first time. Okay? And we can lay that out, plot that out, 
over time or over each cycle during the curing process. And you'll see that it kind of goes up just a little bit, but just a little bit. But most of it takes place through the first curing cycle. And so we use that coupled with the spectral analysis work and of the curing light itself and figure out how well the gels cure. And when we've done all of this research work, gels that are specific for a curing lamp need to be used with that lamp. Gels that are specific for a different lamp need to be used with that second lamp. And you really shouldn't mix the two. So referring to your lamp comparison chart, Neil Rituals asks, does this mean most white label, low quality gels will cure completely in a high quality lamp? Yes, but they'll generate a lot more of an exothermic reaction. And that's a generalized statement. Not all white label gels will cure well in a higher output way. Great to know. We have another question. How close are we to a reliable cordless curing unit? Very far away from it. And the reason why is because the batteries themselves decrease their potential electrical output as it's being used. And as that decreases, then the, ex the, the output from the curing lamp will also decrease. Perfect. We do have a great comment here I wanted to share. Tipsy Diva underscore Nailer says, hey, our favorite chemist, love your lives. Super simple to follow and makes it so much easier to explain in a simple way to my clients too. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> all right, go ahead and continue. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So if we take a look at all of this information, it breaks down to what's going to cure, what's not going to cure, and you just have to basically stick with the light that's designed to cure with that gel. Okay. Um, and you can see that there are differences between base coats, building, building a bottle, uh, gel polishes, and then top coats. Okay, so when we, t when we take a look at it, you, can, you really have to look at all the different components and how each one of those will perform. The base coats are essential because that's what gives you your adhesives of the natural layer. And if that adhesive layer is not properly cured, everything on top of it will fail. Okay, so you have to make sure that you cure it really, really well. And then on all the colors, if the curing lamp itself is designed to cure something like C and D, or say RP plus, and you're using the long curing lamp, it's not going to cure as thick wood. So all of these things will have a definite impact on the performance of that product. Okay, and I'm not trying to degrade anybody's brand because everybody is you know, has a good brand and the, the chemistry out there is solid. But you just have to make sure that you use the solid chemistry with the solid curing technology. Okay. And I think that's it on that one. So does anybody have any questions? We have the dry erase board that we can go to and I can answer some more questions there. Awesome, if you have questions, send them in so we can ask Jim live and you can get his answers. Let's see, share it. The beauty box, Keith says hi from Scotland. <laughs> Let's see, oh, they're popping in, here we go. <laughs> I just love this brand so much, always there supporting us pros. Uh, Nail Love Stive says, is the C&D lamp safe to use with LE products? I never used to like science, but since I'm watching your videos, I got hooked. Okay. So yeah, the C&D lamp is good for the light elegance product line. Just make sure that when you are doing the curing, if your client experiences any exothermic reaction that becomes uncomfortable, use one of the post settings. Okay. And that should take care of it. And then at the end of the entire service, you can always go ahead and cure just a little bit longer without a seven. But the pulse setting will, will control how much of the exothermic reaction that client experiences. Perfect. This is an amazing PowerPoint. Could we please have a PDF of all of this information on the screen? <laughs> <laughs> I might be able to share that with you. <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, Tipsy Diva says, can Ellie Color Gels, Buttercream, and Glitter Gel, for example, mix? or just the building gels? Now you can mix the buttercreams, you can mix the P plus, you can mix a little bit of the buttercream with the glitter gels. Yeah, so all of that's totally fine. All the resins that we have in the building are all compatible. Um, so mixing them together is just fine. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Is a gelish lamp suitable for LE products? Yes, gelish lamp and our lamp are actually made in the same facility and use similar curing technology. 
Good to know. Uh, Jellish lamp is very well made. Um, let's see. Vidar is on and says, always blown away how open and honest you as a company are when it comes to technology and chemistry. Shows the passion for our safety as nail techs. Uh, let's see. OMG, I've just noticed Jim's polo shirt. Can we get these in the UK? <laughs> <laughs> it's um, actually, it's a Lululemon polo shirt. Oh. We have a little, little display on the back for the logo. But, yeah, Can we, we see like a runway out. walk? Can we no, see it show it off? No. <laughs> um, let's see here. Why are buttercreams hard gels and not formulated to soak off? Because the resins that we use in the buttercreams are specific for our gels and gives us better durability, better scratch resistance. Gives us also the ability to cure just a little bit thicker than the soak off systems. So we stick with the hard, hard technology on that one. Perfect. I love Jim's attention to detail. Every product must be the best and safest it can be with science to back it up. It really helps myself and my clients feel safe using the LE products. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Awesome. We do a lot of research and we do a lot of quality control before we actually use the incoming raw materials to ensure that what it is that we're putting into the product is QC'd to our standards. And then when we make it, we quality control check it every step of the way. Beautiful. Uh, Jojo says, what is your recommendation for techs who want to use different brands for base or builder and color? Is this safe when using their own unique lamps? Are there any risks to doing this? There are risks because if the builder or the base material is designed to cure one lamp and you're using, say, our lamp to cure it, it could become too hot. And so you have to make sure that when you are doing that work that you're evaluating it appropriately and that you're getting a proper cure. So if you're using, say, the Sun 4 light and you're using the light elegance gel that's designed to cure it in the LED dot Gen 3, the two are so dissimilar that if you try and cure the gel, the light elegance gel in the gen and that uh, sun four, it's not going to cure well. And so that winds up being the problem. If you use a gel that's been designed to cure in the sun four, but you cure it in the gen three, it's going to wind up creating too much exothermic reaction. So do you suggest um, that they have multiple different lamps or go with the best curing lamp on the market? You can go with the best curing lamp on the market and then make sure that when your client puts their fingers in the light that as long as they don't experience the exothermic reaction to the point where it's extremely uncomfortable, then they should be fine. If the exothermic reaction exceeds, say, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, then what could happen is you could damage the living tissue underneath the fingernail. And if you kill that living tissue underneath the fingernail, the fingernail will just bond from that living tissue and you'll have a lot of bias. Perfect. Would you ever consider creating a product that soaks off as well as cutie base, but as resilient as Jimmy Gel? Yes. All right. We like that answer. <laughs> Why is hemomonomer something you don't use in your products when it's been used at low levels safely before in other brands? Because it's been used at low levels safely in other brands. However, some of the people that come to Light Elegance have developed such an extreme allergy to it because it's been used in a lot of skin contact at times. But if they have an extreme allergy to hemomonomer and then they come to our brand and even if it's a low concentration, they could still develop that allergy. It could still present itself on their end and that becomes less than safe. We found other ways to use different monitors to have a similar performance and that's what we've done. So we use HPMA in some of our products. We use isobutyl methacrylate and we also use isobornal uh, acrylate um, and so, or isobornal methacrylate in our systems. So in those cases, we found that we can have really good performance without the HEMA uh, monitor being used and it's safer. Some of our distributors are so allergic to HEMA that if, you, if they're in the same room as HEMA, they break out. And that's how sensitive some people can become. So we just try to avoid that. And I know you've mentioned in the past too, you don't want your employees working with that product in high quantities as well, which is really awesome. Yeah, so we, we have some people that have been working here uh, for like 17 years, 18 years, and they have no allergies whatsoever to our products or even the raw materials that go into it. So we're really proud about that. 
Love it. I need to visit LEHQ. Next year, I'm going to Las Vegas and Portland to do nails. I'm from Norway and visit family. Is there a way to visit and maybe do a course too? Yes, we could definitely arrange for that. Uh, we're only a two and a half to three hour drive from Portland. It's a beautiful drive up and over the mountains. So you'd go from the valley up past Mount Hood and into the high desert where we're located and we'd love to host you. Beautiful. Wow, so cool they are made in the same place. Uh, would you ever consider making a poly gel or chrome powders? We have done chrome powders in the past. Um, they just happen to fly about the building. And so if you start doing chrome powders, it's really easy for those chrome powders to make their way into other products. So we tried to isolate it, and then it got to the point where we just decided it wasn't worth stocking everything and handling it internally. As far as the polygel type formulations, uh, we've played with them, and we do sell some through Mercado Labs, but we don't have it in the Light Elegance brand, which is such a broad band of products already. Since we our offering is so large, adding just yet another series of products in that offering seems like it could complicate things a little bit more than it already is. I will forever be grateful to Light Elegance and how their products completely changed my mom's nails due to a horrendous reaction. And is it possible to have a soak off builder gel that can be used to create long extensions? We can do that with Jimmy Gel already. So yes, that's possible. <laughs> um, let's see here. Will the LED dot Gen 3 or Gen 2 be better for potentially curing other gels? So the Gen 2 might be potentially better for curing other gels. Uh, the Gen 3 does have a really nice spectral output. It just doesn't reach into the UV range. So if you're using older style gels that only cure in UV, the Gen 2 would be the better way to go. If you're using gels that have been designed to cure invisible spectrum light, then the Gen 3 would be just fine. Perfect. Mm -hmm. What does acrylates copolymer mean on an SDS? Is this ingredient listed as a way to hide what's really in it? No, actually acrylates copolymer is a powder that's been uh, added to a formulation. It can be the little beads that you find in the poly gel. It can also, you'll find it in a lot of different nail polishes as well as gel polishes. It can dissolve into solvents as well as some of the monitors. And it, if you use the monitors and you dissolve the acrylates copolymer in the bat, it makes it thicker, more like an oligomer. It can have a higher monitor content. Uh, and so you get some benefits from a higher monitor content because it soaks off faster and easier than the oligomers do. Uh, but a lot of people wind up having allergies to the monitors that are used to dissolve those acrylates copolymer. So it winds up being sort of a trade-off. Uh, there's the science and the art at the same time that we make our products. And so the acrylates copolymer truly are an active ingredient in the system and they do form a function. But making sure that you have the right amount, that you have the uh, oligomers in there and you use proper monitors and the photo initiators required to make everything happen is crucial. So it is an actual ingredient though, and it's not in there just to hide something else. Perfect. Would a larger lamp that could house two hands at the same time have sufficient carrying power? And is there a reason why most companies don't make this anymore? Uh, they don't make them primarily because if you have both hands in the light, um, maybe you're enjoying a cup of coffee or some tea. Uh, but, but a lot of people like to just use one hand at a time and a different hand. And if you want, you can have two different lights on them on the table, but they wind up being smaller and easier to manage. So the larger lamps also generate more heat because there's more lights that are on inside the light. They have the larger, you know, the larger quantity of lights, the higher quantity. Also requires a larger transformer to convert the AC power source to DC that drives the LED bulbs. And that generates more heat too. So it just becomes a little bit more cumbersome and hard to handle. So I think that's the reason why a lot of people have gone to the smaller lights. And lastly, what are you most excited about for the future of curing lamps in the industry? I'm, I'm, I'm working currently with our, our manufacturer on curing lamps to see what we can do to change the overall layout of the interior of the light uh, based on some new LEDs that are becoming available. 
So that's what we're working on. Love it. We did have one more question. Can we get Jim over to the UK to do a live chemistry class? <laughs> <laughs> we'll work through that with Layla and Jojo, and we would love to have that happen. Perfect. All right. Well, we're all set here. Thank you. Appreciate your time. We'll see you next time. Bye. The big story on this one, in a, just a quick nutshell, is we don't advise mixing brands. And there's a lot of reasons why, because not all brands are the same. The raw materials that are used in a lot of the different brands can be the same, but that's just at the raw material level. But the quantity of those raw materials can vary significantly. And some of the chemistry that's involved that goes into the curing process can vary significantly. They don't advise it. Some brands are similar, some brands are not, and it's difficult for you to determine what those are. You can get extreme exothermic reactions. They can be extremely uncomfortable. That's two extremes in one sense because it's important.